because of limited time, we're just going to jump in and get going. And hopefully, we'll be leaving ample time at the end to get to most, if not all, of your questions. Let's go ahead. I have no conflicts of interest. And just wanted to mention, I've, I've been asked to list the objectives. I don't want to sit and read all of these, so I'm just going to give you a moment to look at the first couple of slides. I think you all have received these already. So in order to save some time, I'm not going to read these, but the objectives are listed here. And we'll proceed. So this webinar is was really prompted by and based largely on, <clears throat> excuse me, this manuscript that was published last month, uh, actually now two months ago, in February in Journal of American Society of Echo, as you see here. Those of you who are not members can get it through the website below. All of our guidelines are accessible free of charge on the American Society of Echo's uh, uh, website. So I'm just giving you that information. As you can see listed in small print, there are a large number of individuals that contributed to this document, and I'm going to list them for you here so you can read them a little more easily. On the left-hand column are members from the United States. On the right-hand column under Arturo Evangelista, my co-chair, are members from Europe. And there were a handful of consultants who didn't write but had an opportunity to review and have input, and we did ask some specific questions of some of these individuals in helping us complete this document. Sort of the methodology was that co-chairmen were selected by the ASE. We drafted a mission statement. Uh, we also drafted an outline of the entire document, submitted that to the American Society of ECHO. The executive committee actually modified it slightly, made some changes, and then we selected our writers, uh, we allocated assignments, we submitted a draft which has been gone over and vetted several times uh, by the societies both in the United States, American Society of ECHO, and the European Society, it used to be European Society of ECHO, it's now called the EACVI, Cardiovascular Imaging Society. Uh, so it had to go through a lot of review from a lot of people to end up in its final document. One of our goals before we started, we, we thought there were a handful of sort of uh, things that would make this a little bit stand out or outstanding and contribute, uh, was to try to get to develop a uniform protocol for measuring the aorta. And as you'll hear later on, we actually didn't accomplish this particular goal, uh, but to uh, different methodologies, MR, CT scan, echo, just to name a few, tend to measure differently, leading edge, leading edge, inner, inner, outer, outer. I think most of you know what I'm referring to, um, and we'll come back to that a little bit later. Uh, we, we wanted to try to nail down what's the variability in measurements, and, and in doing so, how much uh, difference in a measurement from study one to study two or different observers would would mean or indicate a real change from day one to a month or a year later, et cetera, et cetera. We also tried very hard to determine first-line, secondary, tertiary tests for each of the major entities, which I'll list for you. And in, and in trying to achieve some of these consensuses, uh, it's sort of like politics. We, we had a large number of members. Most of us agreed most of the time on everything. But like anything, there were differences of opinion, and we did have to try to reach consensus in forming this document. And there are pros and cons of any consensus or guideline document, but we've done our best. Uh, these are some of the other issues that we wanted to address, and I may or may not discuss all of these issues as we go along. Uh, these are just listing a few more. We wanted to try to classify. There are four or five different grading systems, for example, for aortic atherosclerosis, and we tried to come up with one that kind of combined or united several of those into one that we thought was very good. Uh, poorly defined in the literature was acute, subacute, and chronic aortic dissection. So we polled a bunch of our surgeons that were both on and off of the writing committee and reviewing the literature, and we did come up with that. 
There's very, very little in the literature on imaging of the aorta after surgery, and I think that's one of the uh, strengths of this. Uh, we, we did make an attempt to achieve that. Also, in putting the document together, somewhere along the line, we sent a survey to sort of private or university or um, community hospital imagers, CT and MR, because this uh, our, our committee was largely or a little bit heavy and echo people, uh, we polled outside people, people that were not on the writing committee on some of the issues, and I won't take time to go over every question, but these are just some examples of a survey that we sent to outside people, and we use this information in putting the document together, um, which is your recommended period to measure the aortic root and systole or end diastole uh, and so forth which do you consider to be reliable resolution? Uh, how accurate are we in making a measurement? Are we one millimeter, two millimeters, three millimeters? And you can see the answer from, from the people that were polled. Uh, we did not get a 100% response, but we got a reasonable response from the people that we sent this poll to. And a series of other questions. I'm not gonna take the time to go over these individually. Um, I don't know if you get any of this in a handout or any PDF file after it's over, but I simply wanted to let you know that we did poll people that were not on the writing committee on what we thought were some important issues. Uh, here's another one that I'll just mention. Uh, which arbitrary partition value for thickness of an atheroma should we consider uh, to be severe or complex? And you can see some of the answers there. And again, we'll come back to some of these things later. And this is what we came up with for chronic, subacute, and acute for aortic dissection. Acute, less than two weeks. Subacute, two to six weeks. And chronic, greater than six weeks. We gave some rationale in the manuscript. And there was 95% agreement among both our committee surgeons and some of the outside people on, on those. I also wanted to mention that we purposefully did not touch on management there are a number of guidelines out. I'm just going to quickly show them to you that actually deal more with the clinical aspects. We were de dealing more with the imaging aspects of aortic diseases. And uh, there are a number of very excellent guidelines, generally agreement among them, but not always. And as you see, they come from different places, but I think these references may be valuable to you in addition to ours that focused on imaging. And the most recent one was the American Heart Association ACC guidelines on valvular heart disease, which indirectly uh, touches on the aorta as well. Now, the modalities that we discussed are listed here, uh, chest X-ray, echo, CT scan, MR, et cetera, et cetera, as you see listed. We focused a little bit on those that are highlighted, echo, CT scan, and MRI, but all of these were mentioned, and most of these were also listed in some of our advantage-disadvantage tables uh, when we were choosing or recommending which, is the, uh, which should be the leading uh, or primary modality for a given entity. There was some focus. The first section of this document focused on measuring the aorta. And we do recommend that a series of measurements are made routinely by any of the techniques uh, right at the aortic annulus, the sinus of valsalva, sinotubular junction, and at least one, if not more, measurements of the ascending aorta as shown in this diagram. We wanted to emphasize that uh, it's important to be perpendicular in tortuous aortas or in non-perpendicular cuts, such as shown by this. A uh, uh, dark, darkened line, you can see that we'll get an oval appearance, uh, it, which will not be a true cut of the aorta because we're coming through obliquely, so that we want to be perpendicular as much as possible and come down the center of the aorta in order to make accurate measurements. Uh, there was a real uh, push by our group, Dr. Evangelista, my co-chair and I, and several of the members on our team strongly wanted to unify the way measurements are made among different modalities, MR, CT, and ECHO largely. And we actually, the, the first draft, we had recommended inner to inner, which is a change from the sort of standard going way back uh, 
the leading edge, leading edge measurements of the aortic root and ascending aorta. And that was actually accomplished and was actually sort of vetted and agreed upon by the ASE and European group as well. But very late, about three or four months before publication, based on some new data, a contingency of our group worried that in doing so, uh, the inner inner measurement is a few millimeters smaller than leading edge, leading edge, and there was fear that patients might not be referred to surgery that met some of the standard recommended management criteria, such as five centimeters for Marfan, some people even four and a half, or five and a half for other entities for uh, an arbitrary partition for operating on the aorta, and by switching to a smaller number, there was fear that patients may not get operated on soon enough so we, re- con- we reconvened, we canvassed a group of people, and the majority decided to keep for the moment leading edge, leading edge. Some of you may agree or disagree, but I'm giving you the rationale. We're coming now to the first polling question, and I'm going to ask you all which of the following is the recommended, which is ours, recommended time, period of time, to measure the aortic root, end systole or end diastole. So as you can see, just as uh, the, the, the um, survey that we sent out, there is variability. There is still variability among different societies and groups for recommended. Most of you have chosen end diastole. I'm going to go back to our slides. We chose uh, at this moment end diastole, uh, presumably for greater reproducibility. The blood pressure is a little more stable in end diastole, and end diastole is a little easier to identify by the QRS than the uh, trying to kind of march back and forth to find the, the largest size of the aorta or the end of the T wave on an EKG, which often doesn't show up well in, in a murdered lead. So we're going to move on and get into some of the guts or meat of the paper. And the diseases of the aorta that we discussed, I'm going to list for you. Uh, acute aortic syndromes, a term that's sort of analogous to ACS or acute coronary syndromes as listed here, aortic dissection, intramural hematoma, penetrating atherosclerotic aortic ulcer, and ruptured aortic aneurysm are considered acute aortic syndromes. Some people might consider trauma to be an acute syndrome, which it is, but because it's so special and so identifiable, we know when someone's been in a motor vehicle, um, accident or been stabbed in the heart, so that most people don't include it in this particular category. We discussed a whole host of thoracic aortic aneurysms, probably the most common that we face are bicuspid aortic valve-related aortopathy and Marfan syndrome, but a whole host of others. We do discuss trauma, coarctation, atherosclerosis, uh, aortitis, uh, both infectious and non-infectious, etc., so these were the entities that we discussed uh, and looked at the, how imaging applied to each of these entities. Let's make a few comments about acute aortic syndromes uh, as listed here, just repeating the list for you. And one of the problems is that any delay in uh, diagnosing and then obviously treating these can be very, very fatal. Some of these are among the most catastrophic diseases that any of you will see. I think most of you know that a type A aortic dissection has roughly 1% mortality per hour in the first 24 hours. So if we don't diagnose and get a type A dissection to the operating room quickly, we may lose as many as 25% within the first day. The signs and symptoms are not always um, classic. Uh, aortic dissection, the pain is typically classic. Severe pain, which reaches its maximal intensity right away, often migrates or radiates to the back, lower abdomen and back. But some of these patients have altered mental consciousness, syncope, and they may not be able to give a history. And some of the other entities, the symptoms are not so clear cut as they might be in a typical textbook aortic dissection. So one needs a high index of suspicion, and then, of course, imaging. Let's start to talk about imaging on some of the entities. For aortic dissection, it's 
very important to identify the type or the, where the entry site occurs. Type A dissection must go to the operating room unless there are overwhelming reasons not to, such as very elderly or lots of comorbid conditions. Type B, we tend not to operate immediately, although there has been a movement to a type of intervention. Stent grafts are increasing in popularity in, in selected type B dissections. It's important when you're imaging to determine if the coronary artery is involved. That will affect management. We identify the complications. Aortic regurgitation, which occurs in roughly 50% of type A aortic dissections, pericardial effusion would suggest, not necessarily, but would suggest a, a rupture of a type A, and a left pleural effusion would suggest a rupture of a type B. So rupture is very important. It would drive therapy in mo almost all patients. Any branch ischemia, starting from the coronaries to the head vessels to the gut and renal vessels, very important also, and we try to identify those in patients uh, with, with uh, uh, aortic dissection. Look at the very, very high sensitivity. This is about a decade worth of publications, uh, approaching 700 patients, and you see the sensitivity of transesophageal echo is extremely high. It's also very high with other techniques. This is one of the very few papers that looked at all three major modalities in the same group of patients, and you can see that the accuracy, both sensitivity and specificity, extremely high in all three modalities. This was published by a radiology group, and the radiology test could get completed a little quicker than a TEE in that particular publication. Each of these modalities has advantages and disadvantages. There's not time in a brief webinar such as this to go over all of these for each modality, but I'm listing for you some of the advantages of transesophageal echo. I've already mentioned the high sensitivity and specificity. We can go anywhere. Echo can be done in the emergency room, in the cath lab, in an ICU, even in a hallway, certainly in the echo lab and so forth. We can do this in critically ill patients on ventilators uh, who, who may not be easy to transport to some of the imaging rooms uh, in places uh, such as MR and so forth. Probably still the best technique for detecting, quantitating, and determining the mechanism of aortic regurgitation. We're excellent for coronary involvement with TEE, pericardial effusion, and LV function. All important aspects to evaluate on these patients. Let's look at this slide, why TEE is so good. This little circle here, or oval indicated by the red arrow, is a stent in a patient who had cancer of the esophagus to open the esophagus, and it shows you the proximity to the descending and ascending aorta. The esophagus is right there where we want to be, right in the middle of the ascending and descending aorta, truly a millimeter away from the descending thoracic aorta. Uh, so we're very well placed to image the aorta. The hallmark of a classic aortic dissection is a dissection flap. These tend to be fairly easily to pick up and identify. They tend to oscillate or dance. Uh, they're normally a slam dunk once we have a TEE probe in. In the majority of patients, the aorta is dilated. The walls may be thickened or widened if there's intramural hematoma, and these two can coexist. Uh, we, we do look at aortic insufficiency. As I mentioned, 50% of type A's have uh, aortic regurg, and we look for pericardial and pleural effusion. A few examples. This is a very folded, convoluted dissection flap in this ascending aorta. This is the LV outflow tract. Blood is going in this direction towards the arch easy to see flap. This flap, dissection flap, comes right down to the valve, distorts it, causing prolapse of a leaflet, and even without color, I can tell you aortic regurgitation. And cross-section of the descending thoracic aorta, showing you more rapid flow in the true lumen as compared to the larger false lumen surrounding it. There is flow, probably not easy to see here. It's a very dark red color because it's lower velocity. Let's look at two cases with comparative imaging. 
transesophageal echo and CT scan, look how identical the shape of the true lumen looks in both cases. We could see a little accessory flap in the, in the false lumen with TEE that was too flimsy to be seen here, but clinically unimportant. But look how similar these two images look, as is in this case also. CT scan, this is the arch. This is the true lumen in the brighter or whiter color, and this is the transesophageal echo. Look how virtually identical the dissection flap looks uh, in these different modalities. So uh, really, both can be very good. And if we look at a few in motion, this is what I'm referring to. It's not playing totally smoothly, but you can see this easily identified dissection flap that oscillates or dances back and forth in this next case. This dissection flap is actually uh, prolapsing into the LV outflow tract like an intussusception. And in this very dilated route, again, the mobile, easily discerned dissection flap. And notice that the aortic leaflets are not coapting at all. Without color, I can tell you that there's significant aortic regurgitation due to this dilated aortic root and aortic dissection. And this is the arch of the patient that I showed you before in still, just showing you that the dissection flap easily identified a slam dunk in most patients once we have our TEE probe in. Descending thoracic aorta, true lumen, uh, pointer won't go there, but true lumen here, smaller nearly always, intimal calcium facing the true lumen, larger false lumen, and a left pleural effusion and atelectatic lung in that image. Let's look at a case or two before we move on. This is a middle-aged man uh, who, interestingly, was, was being referred to a vascular surgeon because CT scan had detected a dilated aorta. But prior to his appointment, about a week before he was due to visit the surgeon on his way to work, he collapsed at the door of his work. And here's transesophageal echo. This is a gastric or trans, deep transgastric or gastric view, and this is pericardial effusion, a very important and ominous sign in patients with this section. This is blood. This is a clot hematoma or just gelled blood inside the effusion. This is the LV below. Um, again, you can see this prominent pericardial effusion with probably a hint of tamponade. Good LV function, thick walls, small cavity, good LV function. And now, in an esophageal view, you, we can pick up nicely the dissection flap in the ascending aorta. In another view, the valve is down here, not well shown here, but there's a dissection flap shown here, and probably some intramural hematoma, so a combination of features of two somewhat separate entities in the same patient. The right coronary artery is shown here and not involved in the dissection. We can flow into it. You should always look for the coronary arteries. Very minor aortic regurgitation, mild or trace. Section flap shown again. Here we're illustrating the left coronary artery, not involved in this patient flow going into the coronary artery. And this is the left subclavian artery, which we should always try to identify when we're evaluating these because it's the best way to determine when we have the arch. When we go just proximal to the left subclavian, we're at the arch. We'll come back to that later. This is a 3D echo illustrating how these flaps may look by three-dimensional echo. In further views, you see it really looks more like a curtain or a shelf. This is true lumen, false lumen, and the dissection flap that's sort of mobile, oscillating or floating up and down, uh, nicely rendered by three-dimensional echo. Another case, making a different point, this is descending thoracic aorta. We're at zero degrees, and we have a circular image with an oscillating flap and what's important here is to illustrate that we see little to and fro flow. Uh, these are generally come from where the intercostal arteries are picked off, and these to and fro flows 
are probably the main reason why the false lumen remains patent in approximately 80% of patients with aortic dissection over time, either type A or type B. For those of you who do transesophageal echo, the next couple of slides I think are quite important. This is the arch, very small segment of the aorta, ascending aorta, arch. It's simply the, the part of the aorta from the beginning of the brachiocephalic or innominate artery to the end of the left subclavian. Why do I bother to show this? When we bring our TEE probe up, as we march up from the descending thoracic aorta centimeter by centimeter, and we start to come to what we think is the arch, notice that we get a linear, we get a longitudinal portion of the aorta that's actually in the proximal descending thoracic aorta. So simply by seeing a longitudinal segment does not necessarily mean it's the arch. And many people see the flap here and they say, oh, this is extended into the arch, which might have surgical implications. But that's not true. Uh, you, you need to identify the left subclavian artery and demonstrate that the section actually enters the arch. This is a nice CT scan illustrating the same point. You see the top of the arch, this, 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 the true sort of Roman arch or anatomic arch or candy cane, this is not really the, the true arch right here. This is descending thoracic aorta proximal. This small segment is the arch, and even more exaggerated in this very elderly patient, you see how the arch vessels are cantilevered forward. So most of what we would see here and perhaps misinterpret as arch is actually descending thoracic aorta. I think an important point. Now, for each of the entities that, that I've mentioned earlier, we have tables such as this one. Now, you can't read this very easily, but this is listing the first line, second line, and third line choices of modalities with advantages and disadvantages for CT, MR, TE, et cetera. Let me blow this portion up for you a little bit that might be more readable. So for each entity, this is aortic dissection, we've tried to identify by first line or first and second line test, we've listed for you in an easy chart-like fashion pros and cons, advantages and disadvantages of each of the entities. And we discuss and list for you here, I've already shown you a couple of examples, mechanisms of AOR, a, uh, aortic regurgitation for type A aortic dissection, such as listed here, and I've already shown you a couple of those examples. And you'll see more. I think we'll have a bicuspid valve coming up shortly. So shown here uh, is a very dilated aortic root and aortic regurgitation because the leaflets can no longer co-app because of effacement of the root. Uh, this is similar or maybe the same case that I showed you with intussusception or prolapse of the dissection flap into the out LV outflow tract. Fortunately, these cases usually don't need aortic valve replacement the aortic regurg disappears with the typical repair, and I've shown you this one earlier, another type of AI where, where the aortic valve sort of gets uh, dis disrupted and prolapses because of the dissection flap occurring right down there. Notice that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the sensitivity, and as you'll see in a moment, specificity of the three major imaging techniques, CT scan, TE and MRI, and this is even a little bit older fashion, helical or spiral CT scan, not even um, uh, MDCT, uh, are very high. Aortogram falls down. This is inadequate for such a life-threatening condition, and aortogram is no longer a gold standard or a major imaging te technique for aortic dissection. And this slide shows specificity very high among all of the major imaging modalities. Let's look at another case. This is a 34-year-old man. This is what we do in every patient. It's called a deep transgastric view. And perhaps you can appreciate that the aorta is dilated. This is a part of leaflet, but part of this is dissection flap and uh, perhaps a, a, a valve that is prolapsing. You can see on the right here, there's aortic regurgitation. 
Uh, in this view, the, the LV apex would be at the top, and the arch of the aorta would be towards the bottom of the slide, view that we do routinely. In the same patient, you can see this prominent dissection flap that actually goes right down to the uh, uh, annulus or valve region, dilated ascending aorta, longitudinal cut of the ascending aorta. 3D echo showing something very similar, and you can appreciate even the curtain-like effect of the flap here because it has breadth to it as well. You can see that either the flap and or valve are disrupted, and uh, you know that there's aortic regurgitation going between that gap. Now, this comes to our, uh, one of our second polling questions. Which of the following is the best explanation for aortography failing to detect intramural hematoma, an entity that we'll come to in a moment? Let me go to the polling. Insufficient contrast, poor image quality of the descending aorta, the lumen uh, is, uh, of, an, uh, of an intramural hematoma is typically maintained. Uh, these aren't, we're not able to gate these on aortography or you can't control the respiration in ill patients. So, uh, interesting split. The vast majority of you, we have a really wonderful audience, stated that the lumen is usually normal, and that's the correct answer, uh, and, and I'll illustrate that further as we go along. Let me go back to our slides. So the correct answer here is that the lumen in intramural hemas hematoma is preserved. It's normal. An aortogram is a luminogram. It simply shows us with contrast dye the lumen. There is no dissection flap in this entity. Let's talk for a moment about intramural hematoma. Classic dissection shown on the left has a dissection flap, very distinct as I've illustrated over and over for you, separating a true and a false lumen. Whereas intramural hematoma which some people call an atypical type of aortic dissection, is simply blood within the wall here. Blood dissects within the media, one of the layers, intima media adventitia of the aorta, with a preserved lumen. In an aortogram, which puts dye in the lumen, the lumen looks normal, and usually this surface looks smooth, not irregular, in intramural hematoma. So that's a major difference between intramural hematoma, a type or variant of dissection, and classic aortic dissection. Uh, not rare. Prevalence is 10 to 20% of all dissections by all modalities. Type 3, i.e. descending thoracic aorta only, is more common with intramural, hem intramural hematoma, but we do see, see both. And I've emphasized the normal lumen as being the reason for false negative aortograms. And that's one of the main reasons why aortograms are not, uh, not, uh, not adequate for aortic dissection, because it will miss almost all of these. Look how common. This is a good number of patients, about, uh, about 1,600, 1,700 cases. And you can see prevalence in different studies averaging about 17%. So not a rare entity or form of aortic dissection at all. Imaging features, the wall of the aorta is thickened. It may be crescentic or concentric. The lumen is preserved, as we've mentioned over and over now. No dissection flap. Sometimes there are echolucent areas within the aortic wall, probably indicating that, that blood is... Uh, uh, a bit liquid in those areas and hasn't quite gelled or solidified yet. And if, you hap if there happens to be intimal calcium, it may be displaced centrally. And once again, these are typically and often missed by aortograms. Here are a couple of examples. Notice the lumen, normal, smooth surface, and this very thick wall of the aorta. The thicker the wall, the worse the prognosis. Patients with more than 10 millimeters have a worse prognosis with intramural hematoma than patients who have a thinner uh, uh, wall thickness. This is another transesophageal echo, nearly concentric thickening of the aortic wall. 
from this patient and a preserved lumen, very typical intramural hematoma. One more with a very thick intramural hematoma, two more, and then this is a CT scan, same illustration. There's dye here in the true lo- in the lumen and thickened aortic wall, crescentic shaped surrounding, and MR similar findings. So uh, very typical findings in all three major imaging modalities. This is a middle-aged lady who had chest discomfort in an outside hospital, had a cath because of that. Coronary artery disease was found the next day on an echocardiogram. Uh, uh, aortic regurgitation with pericardial effusion was also noted. A CT scan was performed. She had uh, aortic dissection, and she was referred to our hospital for surgery. You can see here, once again, in a gastric view, pericardial effusion, rounding a thick left ventricle that looks hypokinetic. And this is an intramural hematoma. This is a very thick wall of the ascending aorta. One at the bottom here. This is artifact, just a ray of echoes coming off the posterior wall of the aorta in this TEE. Another view showing this intramural hematoma. Notice no dissection flap, and the lumen looks preserved. And in a cross-sectional view, including the left coronary artery, you can see intramural hematoma surrounding the aortic root, even at the level of the left coronary. Flow was okay in the left coronary artery. And in the descending thoracic aorta, she had a a more typical or classic dissection. So both types can coexist in the same patient. True lumen, false lumen, dissection flap. So she had an intramural hematoma in the ascending aorta and a more typical looking dissection in the descending thoracic aorta. We're going to move to our third polling question and move on to some other topics. Which of the following is not typically associated with a bicuspid aortic valve? Aortic stenosis or regurgitation, aortopathy, meaning disease of the aorta itself, cardiomyopathy, coarctation, or dissection. So the vast, vast majority, it's a very sharp audience, say cardiomyopathy. Now there are a few patients who may have two diseases, but typically, cardiomyopathy is not a part of the bicuspid valve complex, which does include aortopathy, coarctation, aortic dissection, or aortic rupture, not listed here as one of the choices. Cardiomyopathy was the correct answer, and all of you are astute. One last example of an intramural hematoma, and I'm showing this for, a specific, for two specific reasons. This one is subtle, not like the last one. Young man with a known bicuspid valve who had even had a coarct repair in the remote past now presents with very typical severe chest pain radiating to the back and syncope. And when we look at our TEE, a little bit tough here, not a piece of cake. This real, the thickened wall, or is it a little bit of a tangential cut? It does look a little thicker than the posterior wall. This is now anterior on a TEE. So is that an intramural hematoma or not? You can see the bicuspid valve. And when we scan a little above the valve into the ascending aorta, this is, sorry, the bicuspid valve again, shown very nicely, football-shaped, oval-shaped, CBS sign, whatever you want to call it. Um, In some other views, perhaps looking a little more believable uh, that this is an intramural hematoma. And when we scan above the valve, we see again a a thick wall there. Uh, Notice the right coronary artery is here. But this is a little more subtle than some of the others that I uh, showed you. And we did take this patient straight to the operating room uh, where, in fact, an intramural hematoma was found and confirmed. Uh, I'll show you. And a a tube graph was, was done here. This is the aorta being opened. And this, this is the wall of the aorta being split by this intramural hematoma here. And not thick like some of the other cases that I've shown you. And further, to make a point, an actual little tear, not the usual two, four centimeter big tears that we see in a classic dissection, 
Now, many people think that intramural hematomas are only caused by rupture of the vasa vasorum, little blood vessels within the aortic wall, and that probably is a cause in some. But in others, small intimal tears, often missed by both surgeons and pathologists, may be present, and with more recent studies, more of those have been found. So at least two different uh, pathogenetic mechanisms for ending up with an intramural hematoma. For time's sake, I'm not going to list all of the uh, 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 key points that I've listed here, but in most of the entities that are discussed in this manuscript, we've listed in addition to some of the other features that I've mentioned earlier, uh, we mentioned key points on many of these as listed here, and I won't take time to go into them. Uh, thank you. Uh, one other type of acute aortic syndrome is a penetrating atherosclerotic ulcer. Uh, these are plaques that rupture and disrupt or get through the internal elastic lamina. They've got to reach the media in order to be classified as a penetrating ulcer. So as shown in this diagram, this is an ulcer into this plaque. Notice the irregularity of the surface of the plaque. But this has gotten through the internal elastic lamina between the intima and media and burrowed into the media. They can also burrow all the way out and rupture. Uh, so these are, these are potentially dangerous also. They're not as common. This is sort of a crude, not exact to, to science, but relative prevalence of penetrating ulcer, intramural hematoma, and aortic dissection. Notice that the majority of them, above 90%, occur in the descending thoracic aorta. Uh, some of the characteristics are listed here, and for time's sake, I'm going to skip detailed discussion, but show you an example or two of cases that uh, may have been. It's not easy by echo to determine if they actually get into the media or not, so we can't always be 100% sure, but some of these uh, could easily represent penetrating ulcers. You see, this is an atherosclerotic plaque with an ulcer uh, here. And this is one of our pathology cases that was documented. Uh, this, this did burrow into the media and actually caused an intramural hematoma. It is an entity that's associated with intramural hematoma. There's blood. Pardon me. Let me go forward again. There, there's blood within the media here. And these are some features of uh, penetrating ulcers. CT scan is first line, MR second line. TEE is a little bit difficult to determine, as I've alluded to you before. Um, I think for time's sake, I'm going to skip through some of our content because I do want to leave ample time for Q&A, but I want to make a few additional points. These were, the, these were the types of thoracic aortic aneurysms that we discuss in this manuscript listed here. The goals of imaging are seen in the manuscript, table 16. And again, imaging choices for aneurysm, CT first line, MR second line, TTE uh, second line, and transesophageal uh, uh, third line, et cetera, et cetera. Last topic that we'll discuss that I'm going to skip the polling question for time's sake is uh, an, an atheroma of the aorta. And we've come up, this is kind of a compilation of a handful of papers that had very similar but slightly variable grading systems. And this is what we came up simply by consensus. It's a little bit arbitrary, but we had a large number of experts coming up with this. And so we're calling uh, mild uh, atheroma being 2 to 3 millimeters, moderate 3 to 5, severe more than 5, and complex, any of these grades that have either an ulcer or mobile component. And what I mean by mobile component, I'll show you in a moment. Uh, this is normal. These are two layers of the aorta. If you image very carefully with TE, you can often see two layers. This would be mild, less than 3 millimeters, moderate, more than three millimeters, and severe, this is probably close to a centimeter or at least seven or eight millimeters, we would call severe. Be careful because if you've got a tangential cut of the aorta, you can make something look like atherosclerosis that is not. If you're not down the barrel, if you're tangential and off to the side, 
this wall, uh, the, the, the walls that we're imaging were not perpendicular down here, will look unduly thick, so you need to rotate your probe to eliminate that possible side effect. And this is a patient that was referred to us for TAVI, and we're looking at the aorta in the cath lab, actually. Uh, some of these we look at before if we have high index of suspicion. You can see a large atheroma with mobile component, more mobile component, different area, uh, et cetera. We had 3D on that showing lots of mobile components, and we backed off of that patient. So to summarize, um, our imaging techniques have helped us tremendously. We do better at diagnosing these conditions. We understand the pathogenesis better because of improved imaging techniques over the last decade or so. Um, which uh, which uh, technique, modality you choose depends on the accuracy. Uh, is it available and do you have expertise in your own hospital, uh, et cetera? We do look at cost to some degree. Transthoracic echo is still most often used for aortic root assessment, but not as good for the ascending aorta after a few centimeters, and we need to rely on other tests. Um, my, I think this is the last slide or so in the paper, and I won't go over these because I want to get to Q&A, but we've listed comparisons of CT, PE, transthoracic, PEE, MRI, and aortography, pros and cons of different aspects. We won't go over these in detail. And some of the clinical aspects, how readily available are these techniques? Uh, do they, are they associated with contrast, with potential complications, especially in patients with renal disease? What about the cost, et cetera? So those are all in the manuscript that we refer you to. I hope some of you have probably read already, and we encourage others of you to read it. And now we'll try to answer as many questions as we can get to. Uh, so let me go back, and I'm going to be reading these in order that they've come in unless we get duplicates. And um, Stanton Drake asks, why waste critical time using 3DTEE when a quick transthoracic echo would have been just as accurate? Well, you're absolutely correct. If, in fact, by transthoracic echo, we make a diagnosis of a type A aortic dissection, we go immediately, as quickly as we can. We notify surgeon operating room, and typically then we'll do our more definitive uh, test, TEE, in the operating room rather than wasting time, so we agree with you. The problem is that T transthoracic echo does not have the same sensitivity. The data I showed you was for TEE, not transthoracic echo. A transthor transthoracic echo has below 80% accuracy for detecting even type A which often begin above the sinotubular junction. So we're getting into an area of the ascending aorta that we sometimes don't see as well as we see the root. Uh, secondly, type B dissections, the, the descending thoracic aorta, the sensitivity is in the range of 30%, 40% at best, just not high enough. So that's our answer. We agree with you when the diagnosis is made. We don't need bigger imaging techniques. Your specific question was about 3D. We don't normally need it, but sometimes it can be helpful with some aspects and in, and, uh, in, in equivocal instances. So often we have the probe in. We know it's going to be 30 minutes or an hour before the patient's going to the operating room, or we're in the operating room as the patient's being prepped and the chest being opened, and we do TEE. We're not really wasting time, uh, but we're simply imaging, filling up time, while proper management is occurring. I hope that answers your question. Um, so why would end diastolic measurement of the aorta slightly estimate aortic uh, uh, dimension? It depends on a variety of features. In systole, the, the, the aorta is compliant, and it does tend to dilate. Now, the root actually expands again a, a little bit in diastole as, as the aortic root fills uh, in, in diastole with diastolic pressure. But the aorta expands and contracts. It gets larger in systole in the ascending aorta and descending aorta. The timing in the descending aorta is a little tricky because there's a delay, but systole reference 
to the aorta at that spot is larger. Uh, if you look at a very young patient doing a, a TEE, you will see in, in a healthy aorta, you'll see bigger, smaller. It's actually visible. The aorta gets larger in systole than it does in diastole. Uh, next question do intramural hematoma dissections present with the same clinical symptoms? And the answer is yes. These patients have the same symptoms um, as a classic dissection. Next question from Dr. Balagura. Uh, actually, Dr. I'm not sure which is the first and last name, so I'll stop there before I butcher your name further. My apologies. Uh, should intramural hematoma be operating on what are the criteria? In the United States and in most countries, intramural hematoma is felt is managed the same as a classic dissection. If it's in the ascending aorta, as the couple of cases I showed you, we do operate. In the descending aorta, we tend not to unless there's rupture or other complications. In Asia, the population seems to be a little different. Some of the data, but not all, some of the data in Asian patients suggests that it may be a slightly more benign condition, but I think the general opinion is that intramural hematoma should be managed like a classic dissection. Um, what Nyquist limit do you use for imaging the coronaries, Mary Lee Dubé or Dub? Very good question. Uh, for imaging alone, of course, we're not using Nyquist limit, but when we put color on, if we don't see flow readily, with our typical Nyquist limit in the range of 50, 60, or maybe 70 that we use for most regurgitant lesions, we may lower it uh, to 30, 40 uh, in order to see the lower velocity flow into the coronary arteries. So good question. We often do lower the Nyquist limit, limit um, on our scale in order to better image coronary flow. Do you have normal values for measuring the thoracic aorta by transthoracic echo uh, by Kristen Billick? And the answer is yes. They're published in the paper. They differ slightly from males to females. I did not put a slide in this presentation, so I'm not going to regurgitate all of the numbers. Uh, and they do vary slightly with age and with sex so that it, it's not a simple, easy answer. I simply refer you to the document. Uh, for that information. Uh, can you talk about measurements indexed versus non-indexed by uh, Dr. Bodawala? Probably is better to index measurements in extremes of patients. If we have a very small or very large patient, uh, indexing is probably better, and you'll see that information in the main manuscript. Um, but in an obvious case, if you've got an obvious, the normal aorta, Let's say I'm just going to throw out a number three or 3.2. Uh, indexing isn't going to help. And if you've got a six centimeter aorta, indexing really doesn't help you there. In borderline cases, yes, indexing becomes more pertinent. Next question. Uh, the best diagnostic imaging tool from Grace Amelda Domingo. And Grace... Um, the answer to that is it depends. It depends on which... Uh, entity, which type of aortic disease, because each one has a maybe a preferred or less preferred uh, modality, uh, and that's all laid out. Each entity has a table which lists the best modality for that particular technique, and sometimes it's a tie, and it depends on the most available at your hospital. Where does your expertise lie? Uh, how quickly can you get the test done in the middle of the night? We have CT scan. 24-7, uh, that is every day, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, TEE, we do, and, but w there's a delay. We may have to come in, may take 20, 30, 45 minutes for the attending to come in from home. So all of those factors determine which is the best imaging tool depending on the presentation and the disease entity. Um, can you explain true lumen, false lumen differences and the designation when performing TEE? Uh, I can a little bit. Um, first of all, uh, if you look at the motion, uh, that may help you. The in systole, the, the, true, the, the dissection flap tends to move away from the true lumen and 
uh, vice versa. In the descending thoracic aorta, nearly always, the vast majority of the cases, the false lumen is larger than the true lumen. If you turn on color and look at flow, the flow is virtually always, nothing's 100% in medicine, but nearly always more rapid in the true lumen than in the false lumen. So that if you look at color or use pul- uh, pulse wave Doppler, you'll see more rapid flow in the true lumen. There are some less universally helpful signs like calcium in the intima. It will always face the true lumen, but it's not always present. Uh, and there's another sign that I can't illustrate well uh, w- uh, without a, a diagram and a, and a blackboard, so I'll skip that, but I've just listed a few for you. Uh, often we see aortic sizes less than 4.5 millimeters, uh, four, five centimeters, 4.5 centimeters on 2D echo. How to follow these patients? Should they have baseline CT as 2D is missing a dimension of the aorta? Really wonderful question. Um, um, by uh, Shalini Modi. Uh, the first, uh, let, let me answer the second part first. I think it is, it is good practice to always get a second imaging technique when you have a, uh, a dimension such as you've mentioned because this patient uh, may have a larger portion of the aorta that we don't see well, typically the more distal portions of the ascending aorta. So we recommend either CT or MR uh, as, a, as a second procedure in patients who have at least moderately dilated aortic roots or aortas, as you've mentioned here. I think it's good practice because it's not easy to make a, a clinical decision based on a single measurement from a single modality, which has some potential pitfalls, which I didn't have time to go into in each modality. Uh, with, with, trans, with transesophageal echo, are we perpendicular or oblique, for example? And I did illustrate that. The other modalities have some respiratory artifacts, motion artifacts, EKG, uh, gating issues, and so forth. So I think a second modality is always uh, important in, in this type of aorta. Beautiful question. And the second part of your question, how to follow these patients, Uh, Again, depending on the nature of the underlying disease, did the patient have Marfan syndrome, bicuspid valve, none of the above, or any one of a host of increasingly importantly recognized genetic conditions, um, we may image more quickly, that is the time intervals between often 3, 6, 12 months, and we've listed that data in most every one of these entities in the paper and it's just too complicated for me to answer for six or seven different entities uh, in the time that we have allotted. But uh, we do recommend serial measurements, yes, and the intervals depend on the previous previous measurement, how rapidly it's uh, uh, changing, and uh, the the, uh, uh, specific patient features. Surgical urgency of an ascending PAU, which are very uncommon, um, if it is, uh, if it's penetrated, if there's evidence that uh, it's extended outside of the adventitial wall, if it really uh, beyond the contours, there's m- uh, more urgency to operate than if it's contained within the wall. It obviously also depends on the age of the patient. We're going to be quicker to operate a 50, 60 year old than than we might be for an 85 or 92 year old patient and depending on other uh, comorbidities. Trying to get to as many questions as I can, so I may not give as detailed as an answer for each one as you'd like. Uh, The next one from Mina Tohid, does the same threshold of evaluation of IMT thickness on aorta apply to IMT in carotid uh, carotid arteries? I don't know uh, uh, the answer to that. I personally don't do vascular imaging and I don't know the answer to that. Um, in general, I, uh, the thickness in an aorta, as I mentioned earlier, uh, any of them bother us. Any intramural hematoma in the ascending aorta we operate on, I doubt if that's true for carotid arteries, but I'm going to have to defer you to other experts and other uh, published literature and, and find some other experts to answer your question. I don't have the expertise to answer that one. We'll do one final question from Liliana Crespo. The trans 
esophagic echo with tridimension with 3D imaging is better than that TTE normal. Not sure if I fully understand it. The the transthoracic echo with 3D. I think you're asking, is it better than 2D TEE? And not necessarily. It's sort of a little bit fun. Uh, it adds some. Uh, understanding of the flap is not being linear, but rather more sheet-like, uh, if you will, but it doesn't necessarily add any new information in many patients. In a few patients, it actually gives us a size. It is superior if you're interested in knowing the size of the entry tear. Dr. Evangelista has uh, answered that question in, pub in earlier publications, so you can actually determine if you want to know the size of the entry tear, its, its area, uh, but it's not necessarily additive. I think we did answer that earlier. And uh, if, if the moderator, if the people at ASC are, are uh, organizing this tell me that we don't have time for any more, we'll have to stop there. I think we've gotten to quite a few questions. 